Dear listeners, today our special guest is the Deputy Head of Mission of Australia, Mr. Anderson. Welcome. Mm-hmm. How are you? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad, glad to be here. Uh, so, uh, a first question, um, our first question is, which are your favorite pos- podcasts and uh, what topics do you like <laughs> to listen? Uh, well, I personally, I like history uh, very much, so um, I don't have a lot of time um, to listen to, to podcasts generally, but uh, anything like history related, uh, I'm really interested. You know, I've been in... Uh, in the Balkans in Belgrade now for two years and uh, very interested in uh, history and architecture. Yeah. Uh, so uh, mm. how many countries have you lived in uh, as your deputy, mm. as a deputy head of mission? Uh, so uh, as I mentioned I've been about two years uh, now in Belgrade. Uh, before that I was uh, four years in China, in Beijing, uh, in a different position. Uh, and before that uh, I've been in Uh, several other countries like um, uh, Nepal, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Sri Lanka, Hong Kong, uh, and probably a few more I can't remember. <laughs> How challenging is your job? Is it really challenging? Uh, so at our embassy, uh, it's quite small. We only have three three people: the ambassador, I'm the deputy, and we have one young diplomat. Uh, we our main tasks are uh, political reporting and economic reporting, uh, business, uh, consular work, uh, passports. Um, I have many many caps that I wear from um, deputy head of mission with some political economic work, but also I'm the consul, so I involved in consular work, passports, notarials, uh, then also security and HR and other operations. So um, I cover quite a lot of areas. Uh, I must say the most challenging definitely is a consular work. Uh, there are many consular cases throughout the year. Uh, some uh, some are quite uh, easy to handle, but there are some which are very uh, sensitive and can be quite tricky. Uh, so they definitely more challenging. So uh, what is the most interesting thing that you have experienced during your job <laughs> or maybe an event or whatever? <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's a difficult question. <laughs> uh, i think personally for me the not just the the chance to live overseas in another country but also to to meet the people experience the culture which means also the food uh the religion uh the architecture the natural scenery uh because we are accredited to three countries uh i get to travel through the region quite a lot um and look at look at the diverse differences between between the countries So uh, personally, uh, just being being able to experience su- such a variety, a diverse number of cultures uh, in all respects is my uh, is, is what really makes me um, enthused every morning. Yeah. Um, I heard that in Australia the percentage of smokers mm. and smoking is really low. Mm-hmm. So mm. how important is to promote that mm-hmm. not only in Australia but all over the world? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's uh, super important. Um, we're very happy to be supporting uh, ECTA, a uh, local NGO here in Bitola, to support educating youth about uh, anti uh, about tobacco and the effects of tobacco. Uh, Australia also had very high smoking rates back after the Second World War. Uh, and then during the 60s and 70s, government came up with many different policies to, uh, to tackle uh, smoking. Um, from TV uh, TV ads to uh, taking away advertising, um, increasing prices on tobacco, uh, many many different uh, policies, uh, and that's developed ever since that that time. Uh, so today in 2023, the uh, smoking population is quite quite small compared to a lot of countries th- due to those uh, those policies. Now one of the biggest challenges is uh, electronic cigarettes or vaping, which is becoming the next part of the tackle, uh, a tackle of uh, anti-tobacco. Um, again, our government is producing some new policies on uh, electronic cigarettes and, and vaping, which will hopefully be effective uh, and continue the, the, um, the low rates of uh, take up of smoking by young people. So um, does Australia, uh, has Australia seen 
um, a impact of that decreasing of smokers and smoking in the health of uh, the overall health mm -hmm. system of the people? Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. The obviously the health effects of smoking create a huge amount of cost for government uh, due to the increased um, amount of people not smoking, then that does lift the burden on the, the health budget. So there's more f funds available to put into research for other diseases uh, such as cancers, uh, uh, new, new medicine. Um, so definitely there is a, a benefit to, um, to people's health uh, and also the funding that the government can um, uh, put new funding into new initiatives. Um, uh, so yes, definitely, yeah, there is a, uh, a different um, decrease. So uh, according to you, mm -hmm. uh, what is the most effective way to promote that mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. people? Is there anything that could mm -hmm. change the mind of the people, mm -hmm. the mindset, you know, about mm -hmm. smoking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I think the, the key is uh, what I'm, what I've been doing today here at the the high school is um, a workshop. So I think these uh, these workshops um, per class of 30, 30 students or so, um, bringing educators uh, from the NGO sector, also from uh, medical sector, just to talk to students uh, at both primary school and and secondary school about uh, explaining what tobacco is, what not just what effects it has on on the body, but also how it affects uh, socially the population. Uh, and and ultimately the country um, with with its effects. So definitely the workshops are, I think, the prime uh, way to educate young people, hopefully to not start smoking. Um, for older people who have been smoking, it, it is difficult to give up. So there needs to be um, an increased focus on support services for people to give up smoking. Um, Australia also has developed a lot of resources for uh, for those smokers who, through their addiction, uh, who would like to smoke, like to give up, but just can't find the way to give up. Uh, there are resources um, available, and that they have been successful as well. So, I think workshops for young people to stop people starting smoking, and then um, services for people who want to give up, who are addicted but are having trouble, then supporting those services as well. Um, a lot of parents uh, should tell their children that they shouldn't smoke. So is that happening in Australia? Are mm -hmm. the parents uh, mm -hmm. reliable about this topic? Mm -hmm. I, are they yeah. telling their mm -hmm. new generation, to the new generation, mm -hmm. that they shouldn't smoke mm -hmm. if they were smokers before? Yeah, yeah, I think definitely if kids come home smoking, if they've been um, hiding, from, hiding the fact from their parents that they're smoking and the, the parents find out, then they will definitely be angry <laughs> and tell the kids to stop smoking. But I think just because of the policies that, that we've had in Australia for a long time, uh, a lot of youth now find it socially acceptable not to smoke, which is also very important. So there's not there's no peer, the, the peer pressure still is there for the vaping and the e-cigarettes, but much less than before. So now for, for kids, it's, it's um, socially okay not to smoke, even when you have someone in your group who maybe smokes that person also will not kind of push people, other their friends to smoke either. It's kind of, um, it's become a, no a normality where if you don't smoke, that's that's the cool thing to, to be not doing. So in that sense, um, I think society also is, is geared now where young people kind of, they know the, the bad benefits and that you don't, they don't have the peer pressure as much. Um, but again, your yeah, parents will also put pressure on, on kids if they are smoking and particularly vaping. Um, so now it's up to, um, I guess, our next stage of our anti-tobacco policies on electronic cigarettes and vaping, to to, uh, to focus on that, to see how to see how the government can um, reduce that. Obviously, the the other big issue is the companies. The, the tobacco companies are very powerful. They have a lot of resources. They um, they know that they have a lot of pressure on them from from traditional smoking, and that's why they are heavily marketing these new new products. So there has to be some uh, some policy to address that. And the easiest one is excise, tobacco excise, so making it more expensive for, for people. Uh, now in Australia, I think one one single cigarette is about two euro. So it's it's very expensive, uh, and it's every year it's indexed as well. It's getting more expensive. Um, but we, we need to think about other tactics and strategies to 
to uh, to come to tackle the big business as well. Um, and our last question: uh, Do you think that uh, that uh, all of that what is happening in mm. Australia you know decreasing their the smoke the smoking mm. uh, percentage and everything does that have an impact uh, on other mm. countries do mm -hmm. you uh, mm -hmm. have you seen any impact mm -hmm. uh, that's an interesting question I think a lot more needs to be done in the statistical data space about smoking um, I think there are a lot of policies um, outside Australia or other countries who have some, some uh, anti-smoking policies but not a lot of concrete data and stats that feed into creating those policies. So I think need, more work needs to be done from those economic institutes, um, medical institutes, the, the information gathering sources to, to build up um, some credible data which will be the evidence to, to support the, some new, new policies. So I think that's one area that needs to be um, enhanced. Um, I think also, internet, as everybody now is internet connected, there's a greater responsibility for uh, sensors like Google, etc., to potentially prevent cigarette advertising uh, and any form of um, advertising which is maybe not so avert. Uh, again, big business is very clever. They have very good tactics about how to address youth, how to pinpoint youth for their products, um, sometimes in ways that uh, is not visible and very, um, uh, very very tricky so I think also there needs to be a lot of pressure on the internet and those companies to monitor what they're, they're doing in their space as well. Do you have any message that you would like to send to the younger, to the youth, uh, to my generation mm -hmm. for, and uh, also mm -hmm. for maybe mm -hmm. those who are smokers? Yeah I think the, the main message is is not not so much just don't don't smoke it's not good for you I think Kids these days and young people these days, they, they know that tobacco is basically no good for you and you, you'll get sick. There's been enough information in media about that. So I think the, the issue for youth is more overcoming any peer pressure. It's, it's, it's being cool not to smoke, I think, is the message. It's when someone offers you a cigarette or a vape, you know, have the courage to say, no, you know, I, don't want to sm I don't want my clothes to smell. You know, I want to be healthy. You know, I'm doing sports. I want to be successful. Just having that um, that confidence, uh, and then actually go back to the person and say, well, actually, you should stop too. You know, it's not good for for your health and your family and uh, all, all the bad benefits. So I think it's just being strong. Just be strong. Just be confident. When someone asks you to try something, just to say no. And I think you do that a few times, and then then it becomes normal. And then as your friends become the same, then your your groups also it becomes normal not to smoke and the chances of starting smoking drop so that's the message thank mm. you so much mm. mr deputy head of mission mm. it was mm. an honor to have mm. you today in our radio well, thank you very much for inviting me I'm really happy to have been here thank, thank you, you so much mm. ladies and gentlemen that was the deputy chief of mission of australia thank you so much